In Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter asks FBI agent Clarice Starling about trauma. What trauma triggered her decision to become an FBI agent? What's that you are? You started at what time? Early, still dark. Then something woke you, didn't it? Was it a dream? What was it? Something also woke the Long Island serial killer. Something woke up and something woke him early in the dark. I heard a strange noise. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't My mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me so much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I fear. Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, the ogre also heard something strange or he saw something, heard it calling to him, heard and felt it tugging, this great weight, there's some great weight inside of him, a great burden that he was carrying with him. And if there's any doubt about this, if you look at the incredible clutter in that house, you can see that he'd never really shaken off the past. I was screaming. Some kind of screaming like a child's boy. What was this burden he was carrying with him, carrying with him from childhood? Well, in order to develop this hypothesis on what triggered the killer, we're going to make four assumptions. First, that Sandra Christia was the first victim. We don't know that for sure, but we're going to assume that for the purposes of this deep dive. Second, that Sandra Christia was human's victim. We also don't know, know that for a fact. Also, third that the target reference, the target, sorry, residence in the indictment refers to 105 First Avenue in Massapequa Park, that sort of ramshackled house. And what's quite interesting is for so long people said, no, it's a normal house, there's nothing wrong with it. Quite interesting that that's how people kind of assess that. I didn't. From the beginning, you could clearly see that there's something wrong with that house compared to the other houses in the neighborhood. And then fourth, and most important, witness three in the indictment is assumed to be Heuermann's first wife, Elizabeth Ryan. Now, before we get to the rest of this analysis, this is deep dive number two. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're enjoying this analysis, please like, share, leave a shitty comment, and let's get started. So let's jump right into the indictment, Heuermann's unfettered access to target residence during the disappearance and murder of Ms. Sandra Costilla. And obviously what we're assuming as target residence refers to his mother's house, refers to that house that we've gotten to know so well. And I could be wrong, maybe it's not. And so this is from the indictment. As noted Supra, based on post-arrest interviews with Uh, witnesses, the Gilgo Homicide Task Force has learned that witness three and defendant human began living together at Target Residence in 1991. And we assume that to mean Elizabeth Ryan, his wife, whom I think he married in 1990, lived together at the Target Residence, I guess, with his mother. Then in September 1993, this is so important, this is so crucial, Again, this comes straight out of the indictment. This is so important, this information, in terms of timing, in terms of context, giving us an indication what led to what appears to be the first murder, the first of at least six that we know of. What started it? What kicked it off? What was it? So two months before Costier's disappearance and murder... In September 1993, Witness 3, assumed to be Elizabeth Ryan, his wife, moved out, moved out of this target residence, moved out of the house. 
And prior to Witness 3, and this really needs to be highlighted, really needs to be emphasized, prior to Witness 3, again, assumed to be Elizabeth Ryan, leaving the target residence, assumed to be um, Ewerman's mother's house. Ewerman's mother had moved out of the target residence. This is huge. Based on the foregoing, neither Ewerman's mother nor Witness 3 were living at the target residence during the time of Sandra Costilla's murder. They leave and in that gap, in that space, doesn't he commit this crime and that then becomes the pattern. When his wife isn't there, that's when things happen. That's when and where and how things happen. Back to the indictment. Accordingly, the murders of all four charged victims and now the murders of Miss Taylor and Miss Costier occurred at times when Defendant Heuermann would have had unfettered time to execute his plans for each victim without any fear that his family or others residing at target residence would uncover or learn of his involvement in his crimes. Now, we can infer from this where it's really... Um, kind of acknowledging and um, grouping all six victims that 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 um, the um, that that no one else was present in the target residence when all of these six victims died well that's referring to a single residence and what residence could it be other than human's home the the house that form that used to belong to his mother does that make sense and so this is the trigger event. The trigger event was thus the double blow, firstly, of his mother moving out of the home. And he, this was a, a mama's boy, right? You know, you might not think it's a big deal uh, leaving your mother or your mother leaving you. If you're a mama's boy or a mama's girl, then it would be quite a significant step. And it's not just his mother leaving him and his mother leaves him first. But then not long after that, his wife leaves him. And so what happens? Ureman finds himself alone. He's 29 years old. It's a kind of a milestone age, like, like 39 years old or 18 years old, right? Where you tend to take stock of your life. And at this point, Ureman has now transitioned into an existential crisis. This was triggered by the exodus of two people, both women, from the household right? Two of the most important people in his life, his mother and his wife. He grew up with his mother. His father died when he was 12 years old. So she had a massive impact on his life. She's gone. His wife, gone. And, and now he has to deal with being alone with his thoughts. And what are his thoughts? It's not just this trigger event in isolation. It's not this trigger event in a vacuum. Something else led up to that, that primed him to be triggered. But this prime was a long, slow burn, right? And what are we talking about? Well, according to one article, I think it's titled, Gilgo Beach Serial Killer Rex Human's High School Reunion Classmates Say That He Was a Loner Who Developed a Mean Streak After Suffering Horrific B Bullying. And they don't just say that he was bullied. They don't just say that it was a little bit. They'd say it was horrific, and they say that he was everyone's punch bag. This is from the article. The class of 1983, and bear in mind when the murders started, was on the 10-year reunion. He'd been out of school for 10 years, and now he's 29 years old, and he's reflecting on where he is 10 years old, and guess what? He's finding those voices those sentiments are right there, still with him, 10 years later. No strange noise. What was it? That was screaming. And Heuermann's hearing the same strange noise, screams from his childhood, from his youth. And what exactly are we talking about? Well... John Parisi told the New York Times, quote, he got picked on a lot. He would take it and take it and walk away. I've seen him pushed to his limit. That's not just ordinary bullying. 
Ewerman was described as awkward and he became larger and more menacing in high school after students tortured him verbally. That's quite a strong word. Not just pushed to his limit, not just picked on, not just picked on by everyone, tortured. Parisi added, I was really scared of him. He was the type of guy, if he snapped, he could really hurt you. And so they could tell they were antagonizing him. He was antagonized. He was someone who could be riled up, someone who could get aggressive, someone who was getting angry. And they liked to get a rise out of him. The article goes on to note, he was disillusioned and he was misguided. You had to be very careful. So they knew they were almost creating a ticking time bomb. They're kind of playing with fire here. Others describe human as an outcast and nerdy who was in the drama club as a stagehand but had few fr- friends. So he's isolated. He's alone. And now, once again, despite getting married, despite living with his mother, now he's alone again. He just can't escape it. Don of Falls, who attended kindergarten through the 12th grade with a suspected killer, said he wasn't surprised at Hewerman's arrest. He said, oh my God, it fits perfectly. That's the weird guy. He said, Hewerman was a recluse, very quiet. You just saw him as a guy by himself. He barely spoke. He was seen as weird, someone you didn't see eye to eye with. And so when 1993 rolls around 10 years later, it's the 10-year anniversary of Ewerman's high school reunion, does he go to it? If he does, is he triggered by it? But now the only people left in his tiny universe have abandoned, betrayed him as well by leaving. And so in September, two months before the first murder, all of this comes back to roost. In his loneliness, in his isolation, he feels the hours, he feels the past, the haunted, horrible past coming back to roost. He hears those, he hears that, he feels that torture again in his body. And all of this kind of echoes through him. Outcast, recluse, few friends, a guy by himself, and now is that guy again. It's hard to say who likely had a more significant impact on human psyche, his mother Dolores or his first wife Elizabeth, but I'm going to go with his mother. What do we know about her? According to Musto, everyone at school knew Hewerman had a difficult home life and frequently clashed with his father, particularly after he was allegedly busted for shoplifting. Why is he getting in trouble? He's fighting with his dad. It was common knowledge. That's according to um, Musto. Hewerman was 12 when his father died in 1975, according to the Times. And so the death of Hewerman's father, before Hewerman was even a teenager, you know, he didn't have his father to kind of guide him through this whole thing of courtship and the opposite sex. And so what happens? His custody transfers to Dolores, the monster's mother. What do we know about this? Well, he and his siblings, including his brother Craig, Craig later served time in prison for fatally running down a police captain while drunk and high. Well, they were both raised by their mother, Dolores, who is now 93. She was said to be a very controlling woman, and further, that human as a kid ended up being a mama's boy. She was in control. She took away, in a sense, his agency, and so when Mama disappeared from the scene, Ewerman found himself, as I say, in an existential crisis. He was that high school kid again, and those raw high school traumas suddenly came home to that empty house to roost. Criminolo- criminologist Scott Bond, who, was, who accurately profiled the accused Gilgo Beach uh, killer back in 2011, so about 13 years before he was actually apprehended, said that Hewerman was a psychopath and had heard that his mom, so, so this criminolo- criminologist, heard that Hewerman's mother was, are you sure you want to hear this, not just controlling, but domineering. And so what does Hewerman do with his victims? He dominates them. 
And this, as the criminologist says, this control from his mother, this domineering raising of his son from his mother probably shaped his twisted persona in some way. Now, I don't think the word psychopath is generally helpful. It's not helpful here. Uh, Human wasn't triggered because he was an unfeeling, heartless monster. Let me say that again. Human wasn't triggered to murder and do what he did because he lacked feeling, because he didn't have a heart. It's precisely the opposite. Because he did have feelings, because he did have a heart, because he was affected by days and weeks and months and years, endless years of relentless torture, psychological torture, um, endless um, verbal kind of um, insults, jeering, um, a kind of a holocaust of bullying at school where he was everybody's punch bag. And that it's not like that didn't affect him. It did affect him because he was a person like anybody else. He's got feelings. And that's got to go, that, that kind of toxic... Um, all, all of that horrible stuff is, stews and goes somewhere if you don't deal with it. And so um, think about it. It's beco- precisely because of feelings, because he had a heart, and because of the nasty way society treated him. And I know you just want to say he's a psychopath, that's why he committed this crime. There's also a stake that society has in this crime against society, right? Because because of, just in part, the way society, the nasty way society treated him, that, that's, that he developed these violent vexations. He was bullied at school. He was dominated at home without a father. You know, he couldn't escape. He couldn't escape this trauma. He got it at school. He got it at home. And all of this then started to twist his attitudes towards people, but women in particular. You kind of get a sense of inevitability about it, tragic inevitability. And so listen to this. This is from the criminologist Scott Bond, who said, Human had a kind of unusual incestuous relationship in an emotional sense with his mother, which could be a contributing factor to his pathology. Now think about it. He's trying to escape the horror show of school and his mother's an already controlling kind of person. His father's out the picture. And so what is happening, he's going to become a lot closer to his mother. But by becoming a mama's boy, he's going to lose agency. He's not going to really know how to... He needs to individuate. He needs to move away from his mother and reach out into the world. Instead, he's kind of becoming infantilized and he's kind of not growing up, is not maturing. And so um, the mommy issues and the emotional investment were very definitely sowing poisonous seeds that germinated into a psychopathology. And so this criminologist goes on to say, who knows what was ticking beneath the surface? He may have been rejecting the loving, doting son, when in fact there may have been some deep-seated resentment towards mom. Absolutely. Absolutely he had resentments towards mom, but also to women in general. Just two months after being ditched in September 1993, he apparently got his revenge. And I guess for him it was sweet because he wanted it again. He selected a victim and one can see starting off he wasn't even able to get the sort of prostitute he wanted. Costier was older and perhaps darker than he wanted and what he wanted to do to her was what he'd wanted to do to all women for the longest time. And I'm going to be dealing with this whole thing of exteriors in our analysis of of self-esteem so don't miss that. But what does he want to do? He wants to penetrate beneath those impenetrable, inaccessible, unapproachable sexual exteriors that have kind of been belittling him and and kind of just been something that he's not been able to uh, kind of access. And so how does he do that? He does it clumsily and messily. 
And so this brings us to the 1993 discovery of the human remains of Sandra Christia. And basically her body is kind of like a painting and the painting gives you a sense. And I know it's kind of a grotesque way of thinking about it, but the painting is giving you an impression of the artist. And even that psychology is is uh, expressed elsewhere in affidavit. That in itself is also troublingly fascinating and we're going to deal with that in the next analysis but let's deal with the canvas and I know it's a horribly dehumanizing way of, 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 of saying it but let's deal with the human remains what did they discover with this first set of human remains well on or about November 20th 1993 remember human's mother and wife left him in September of 1993. Two months later, I guess he acted on these impulses that had been brewing in him for so long, right, and are now activated. And guess what? They found her body while hunting in a wooded area of Southampton. Well, what was human? A hunter. That's probably how he knew about this area himself. It was in the vicinity of 50 Old Fish Cove Road, in North Sea, Suffolk County, New York. That's where they discovered the remains of Sandra Christia, born in 1965. The victim, who had been 28 years old at the time, one year younger than Hewerman, was lying on her back with her arms outstretched over her head with her uncovered legs spread apart. So you can see this is very much a sexual attack. The victim's shirt had been pulled up over her torso and head, exposing the victim's breasts. The victim had numerous sharp force injuries to her face, torso, breast, left thigh, and vaginal area. What is going on here in terms of that? That is, in a way, his revenge on women, but I think, in, to some extent, some specific woman in his universe. He's injuring them, but he also feels obviously symbolically injured. This is a symbolic retribution. He's felt injured by words. He's now injuring with a deed. Ms. Costia was a native of Trinidad and Tobago, but had been living in New York prior to her disappearance and murder. So what are we talking about? School and home primed him. In 1993, his, his mother and wife leaving him back to back triggered him if only one of them had left him maybe he could have kind of gotten over it but both of them leave him back to back it's a double blow and suddenly he's alone does that make sense 29 years old facing the onset of his, his 30s realizes his youth is basically over his marriage is over he's lost his mommy his 10 year high school reunion does he go to it does he want to go to it, but remembers the horror show that it was, remembers being rejected by, the, by those women, but now, now by the women closest to him. Well, all in the same year. And then the realization that the past isn't really past after all. He's going to have to deal with it. Then something woke you, didn't it? Was it a dream? What was it? Something woke the Long Island serial killer. Something woke up and something woke him early in the dark. I heard a strange noise. That noise was silence and in that silence, the roar of blood in his ears, blood in his loins, blood in his bones. Outcast, recluse, few friends, a guy by himself. Now he's that guy again, and now he wants his revenge. Does that make sense? Thank you for listening. Look out for deep dive number three, and I'll see you guys next time.